Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Wednesday morning mastermind call with Daily Refinement. Today's the beginning of a new series. Um, I want to revisit one of my main goals for reselling, which is I want to publish the best reselling blog post ever. And I was doing that before, but I kind of discontinued that. But I want to start it over again today and I want to work on it every single day for a year and see what happens to it because we can update it as we go. And at the end, we should have a resource that everyone can use. Um, and I want to start today with a quote from Maya Angelou, which is, do the best you can until you know better Then, when you know better, do better. That's one of my favorite quotes of all time. This is why I don't judge other parents because I have no idea what they're going through. I've never judged another reseller. I don't talk about other resellers because I've never one day stepped up I've never taken a step in anybody's shoes. I have no idea what they're going through. So for some people, the best might be figuring out how to list your first item. For other people, the best might be finishing 15 listings before six in the morning, before your kids get up. So the best is different for everyone. And I wanted to ask people today, since it's day one, what is the best for you? Is it easily being able to pay your bills? Is it easily being able to find supply? I was thinking about this concept yesterday of what if I tried to franchise reselling? What would that look like? Like if I wanted to guarantee Brian is successful, would I have to give him all the supply, all the keywords for the title, the photography setup, the way to take the photos, the storage system, the shipping system and the age promotion system to discount items if they don't sell. Does that all have to be included? Yesterday, somebody asked me, why isn't there like a guide of perfect titles for every single item? Like nothing is new. How come there's not like a, why doesn't eBay just recommend the best title for that item? They've already seen that item. So that's, that's kind of interesting because I think the best title is subjective. Depends on who you're looking for. Right? If you're looking for that quick sale, you're probably going to be looking for short title, reach the most amount of people. But if the quick sale doesn't happen, you risk going to the bottom of the search results because too many people bounce. So you have a short title, tons of people see it. If they don't convert, eBay will say, okay, there's something wrong with this listing. Let's throw it in the bottom of the barrel. Goodbye. This is how Mercari works. If you guys have ever listed on the website Mercari, they front load all the traffic. Everything on Mercari is based on recently listed. So when you're on Mercari, they're going to recommend the newest stuff on the website only. Poshmark, the way it works is they recommend whoever's like active on the platform with the sharing. Because people who are sharing are more likely to ship on time. They should probably do some kind of form of that on eBay, to be honest, to let customers know this seller is actually active. You really don't know on eBay if someone didn't do anything for two weeks. You have no idea. There's no um, icon on the eBay listing that says this seller has been MIA for two weeks. You don't know that. But on Poshmark, you know, because it'll say last shared three weeks ago. So... Remember, if you go for that short title, lots of people, it better convert. Otherwise, you'll be put towards the end. If you're listing it to quote unquote, forget it and never have to go back and adjust it, you better put every single keyword, every single item specific, best price for that to happen. And, and the only thing that you have to adjust in a perfect listing, in my opinion, is the pricing. If you have all the keywords, all the item specifics, great return policy. The only thing that would happen is for some reason, that item's value would be lower in the future. So Jamie says his biggest thing would be to make sure he hits his listing goal. What about you guys? Is that paramount for you guys? Because reseller nirvana for me is being able to sell the, the number of items you need to reach your income goal. And in order to do that, you have to list the number of items that you need to reach your listing goal. Yeah, so, mine is definitely income goal plus investment. Okay. So does your income goal include your investments you want to make? 
Yes. Okay. I think everyone should do that. And this might sound intense, guys, but um, I want everyone to make a savings goal of at least $6,000 a month. It might sound ridiculous because maybe you don't even make $6,000 a month, but $6,000 a month is what I want people to set their savings goal at because over the course of 10 years, it's a million dollars if you invest it in any kind of normal investment, a home or uh, index funds. You, over the course of 10 years, your $720,000 investment will most likely be a million dollars or more. So everyone set your goal at $6,000 a month savings. If you don't know how, that's okay. I was just listening to an Andrew Huberman podcast with David Goggins, and he said something really, really fascinating to me, which was when you do something hard, it makes this part of your brain grow. I don't know what it's called. It's a long medical term. And um, do something hard or you do something uncomfortable or do something you don't like, that part of your brain grows. And that part of your brain has been linked to success financially and health-wise. That's, um, that's why I think that when I was going to get engaged, my wife was like, it's time. Where's my ring? Um, I know exactly what ring I want. Are you saving for it? And I said, no, I am not. So I had to change myself to make enough money to save for that ring and then my wife said go get her so when i got her to the ring two weeks later she said time to plan the wedding which i which i was not ready for because that was intense okay so ring then wedding right then instead of going on our honeymoon um covid happened okay because so it, and covid happened one month earlier in asia than it did here so our honeymoon was canceled. Then we decided, okay, we're going to have a kid, then two kids, then buy one home, then buy two homes. The last six or seven years for me has been harder and harder and harder and harder. And I've had less and less and less time. And I bet you that part of my brain is 10 times bigger than seven years ago, because the level of discomfort that I can endure is really high. So Lauren said a few days ago that I'm very resilient. And I actually do think that should be something that you gain from this, from the calls that I have, because it's so unpredictable what happens in reselling, in business, in business, especially. And I consider reselling a full contact sport. It's, it's like football. It's not like golf. The people who are leisurely reselling, I don't know a single one that pays their bills. The ones that are at war, like Jamie, for example, in there figuring out what keywords work, what title structures work, what pricing works, right? If you're in there trying to figure it out, you, you, your likelihood of success is very, very high. Now, of course, Jamie is right. There are people that golf and treat it the same way. Um, I played golf with Tony Finau and Daniel Summerhays growing up, both of them are successful PGA tour players. Um, I remember I qualified for junior world in San, for San Diego and Utah. I took second place. I shot 72, 69, took second place. Tony Fien, I was 15 years old. Tony Finau was 11 and shot 68, 65. So he was like, I, I don't even less than a, smaller than a teenager, but older than a toddler. And crushed it and he he played in the masters last weekend so i've seen that level of performance before and it's nothing crazy it's just hard things for many years and it turns into world-class everything so you guys don't know but when i grew up playing golf tony finau and daniel summerhays were not um not they're not I mean, Tony Fino actually is, is um, physically gifted, but Daniel Summerhays is like five, he's five foot six. He's, he's like a little tubby. He's not athletic. Right. But I think he's earned $18 million in the PGA tour in the last 20 years or so, but he's extremely resilient. So maybe people don't understand these golf analogies, but I'm just going to give one more. Then I'll move back to reselling. I played with Daniel Summerhays one round. He hit 11 greens and shot seven under. 
He missed seven greens on all seven of those holes he made par. And on the 11 holes where he had a birdie chance, he converted seven out of 11. Unbelievable. Okay. So that means on a round where he did not play well, he, he won. Like just was not playing well, still managed to win. And that's what you guys need. Your life is not going to go as planned. It, everything is going to be messed up. You're never going to have enough time. You're going to have to learn how to do stuff when times are tough. So um, I asked my wife, because my wife is, um, is in finance and human resources, and I asked her, what do the top people do that, um, like, because my wife is working with high-level people at her company. What do they do that normal people do not do? Um, she said, a, a couple of things stand out to me. One is they, they say no a lot. Pretty much say no 99% of the time because they can only do one thing really at a high level. So like the CEO of her company eats the same meals every day for breakfast and lunch, not because he wants to, but because he's like, I only have enough time to do work and hang out with my family. And so food during the day is not important. In the evening, it's important because I want to enjoy it with my family, but during the day, it's not. So I eat the same thing every day and I don't even think about it. Somebody brings it to me and I, I make decisions that impact the company all day. And the second thing was they take a lot of vacation. Now, this sounds weird, though, but it's because you force yourself to, to do what you need to do in a shorter period of time. It's just like when um, I ran out of stuff last week, so I went to Tahoe. While I was gone, I trained two people to um, receive items from me on a forklift. And then this week, I didn't have to receive stuff on a forklift and it was like mind blowing. I went to, um, the reason why I was reluctant to, to, to have somebody else drive the forklift for me is you can die. If you do not operate the forklift properly, it can fall on you and you will die. It's, it's five, it's 5,500 pounds. A forklift weighs more than my minivan. So if, if you, if you fall, you're basically done. So what I did was I figured out all the different places where you can die on a forklift. One is basically um, you uh, turn too quickly, right? The second one is like, basically, I don't know how often this happens. I hope it does not happen very often. When the, when the truck loads into the loading dock and hooks on, the parking brake needs to be on. And you, you should double check with the driver that they're loaded on. I think you should do that. It takes like five minutes, I think, because... During the training that I took, it showed like people falling in the gap between the loading dock and the um, door and like it, it can be fatal. So basically I filmed how to do this. Maybe Keith knows what this is called. I don't know what it's called when the axles have to be moved to the back of the truck um, so that it raises the height of the truck. But some truck drivers don't know how to do that, which is crazy to me because I feel like that's part of the training. So I filmed a truck driver doing that. Right. And then one of the guys that came on Monday did not know how to do that. And we have a high dock at my loading dock and I showed him the, or my worker showed the guy, the video and the guy did it with the video and talking to his dispatch, which is amazing. So that, like, that was like a, um, so all the parts that are involved with the unloading part I filmed. So everyone should be able to do it safely. They unloaded six trucks, which is a lot of inventory safely everything is good um and carrie asked me what is the part of reselling i enjoy the most it is being organized it is shocking how much i love my reseller space right now there's no garbage on the floor there's nothing on any table everything is put away i have more space than i need i received 150 pallets easily didn't have to backtrack one time or move anything out of the way everything was completely organized so I think organization and having enough space, if we're talking about the best, I would want everyone here to have an uncluttered workspace. It should be life-changing. Um, Justin says wheel, wheel chocks could add on an extra step of prevention. This is true. Um, I know at the post office, uh, wheel chocks are required. So I don't know, maybe it's because it's the government, but... Um, 
they, they when I go to the post office to drop off, they do that. Um, so I was thinking, um, I like having numbers that are big and challenge people because I was talking about earlier that muscle that you develop when you're uncomfortable. And now when something unexpected happens, it's okay because I've already experienced that before. Um, usually when bad things happen to me, I can kind of get into the mindset that it's happening for me. Okay. And I, I'm not joking. I'm not making this up. Every day when I wake up, I honestly think I get to do my day to day. Like I get to resell today. I get to hang out with my kids today. And I think it's a different kind of mindset than most people. Um, I, fe I feel like very blessed that I even have a chance to do this. Some people don't, have an opportunity to work for themselves on their own terms at home. Work, being able to work on your own terms at home is like life hack 1000. No commute, no work clothes, no coworkers, no office politics, no ceiling, right? You can write off everything when you work for yourself. When you have a job, you can't write off anything. That's crazy to me that you can't write off your commute. If you have a W-2 job, you can't write off your commute. That's wild to me. Why not? That's completely reasonable. In my opinion, you have to drive there to do your job. But if you're a reseller, you could write off your bike that you use to go to Goodwill on. That's, that's completely fine. I think everyone right now should have um, a resale certificate and be thinking about... Um, trying to reduce steps. You know how I was saying um, successful people say no a lot? Well, I think that that's also true for expenses. You can say, no, I don't want to pay sales tax anymore. I'm only going to buy from suppliers that don't charge me sales tax. You could say, no, I'm not going to ship any supply to me. I'm only going to find local sellers or people are going to bring it to me. I don't want to do any more trend, no more. I'm only going to sell shoes or magazines or clothing or jewelry. I'm not going to sell other things. Each time that you do know, it narrows your focus and you can become a lot bigger. You can become way, way, way bigger because you can focus it. Jamie is saying with YouTube, you can do almost anything. You can learn almost anything on there for free. I would agree. I think the only thing that you cannot learn on YouTube is doing it. Like you have to do it. And then when you do it, your muscle gets stronger. You can do more things. YouTube is the most incredible educational tool ever. There's nothing new about reselling. I learned how to fix a door jam. I learned how to, um, how to organize a, a, all of the stuff I learned from warehousing. I learned on YouTube. And the best YouTube videos are how I prevent my workers from dying on their forklift. These are the 10 things I do. Watch me in my warehouse do it for you live. That's like the best possible video because then the, it's the person that does it, do it. The trucking videos are people go over like, this is what day in the life of a trucker. And it's literally their life doing it. Okay, like that is unbelievable experience that you didn't have before. Back in the day, the um, when VHS came out, this is so wild to me that Tony Hawk said, the reason skateboarding is popular is because of VHS tapes. Like VHS tapes allowed people all over the world to figure out skateboarding. They could just put the tape in, watch it. And then now they can, now they can skateboard. And now this is the, the huge, this huge thing. Millions and millions and millions of people resell. And right now the trending thing is that thrifting is no longer fun because resellers ruined it. If you guys watch TikTok and um, what they like to do is find things that are fresh, like, Maybe a year ago, going to the bins was really cool on TikTok, but now it's no longer cool because capitalism ruined it. People are out there making a living and hunting. And it's true. If you go to the bins, there's always people there trying to make a full-time living now reselling. There's only a couple hundred locations and there's millions of resellers, right? So you got to think about how to do it. Um. How I'm going to approach this group moving forward is, um, and and uh, I'm not being critical of the group at all. I just want to move more towards people sharing what they're working on. Um, and that is the best way to use this group. 
like today I'm working on sourcing. These are what I'm going to be planning on doing. Um, today I'm working on my space. Today I'm working on increasing my listing goal. <clears throat> and I think all these little tiny steps that we do really, really help move the needle. And I think that I really do believe if you're not improving, you need to be left behind. Reselling just moves too fast. Go ahead, Becky. I was just going to say that before I joined the group, I was watching you since the beginning and I thought, okay, I just want all the inventory to come to my garage and big pallets. And I just want to get it out the door as quick as possible. And I want all the best stuff new with tags. And so that's what I was doing all my focus on for pretty much the whole day. But what I've learned in this group is what is right in front of me. So I need to be looking at what's right in front of me and mm -hmm. I need to be consistent and I need to be, need to be going to the thrift stores every day and finding only the highest sell through rate possible items, even if it's less items per day than I was doing before. And all the while taking a small portion of my day to research mm -hmm. and become better at doing the pallets. So I think that's where a lot of people get caught, you know, caught in the weeds is we want this huge thing or we want we want this pallet into our garage type of a situation with all new with tags and we want to get it out the door. But for right now, where we are, that's not possible right now. But I can be, like you said, working on my brain to become better in that, that uh, like yesterday, I just got my resale certificate, but it's taken me like three weeks just to get to that point. And then now I'm starting to make contact slowly. And I think that's the key is just to take it slow. Don't think it's going to happen overnight. I'm telling this to myself. And also just be super consistent with what's right in front of me. Like, what am I, what am I asked to do today? Go to the local thrift store and find super high sell through rate items. Even if it's one item, get it in my store and then focus on what's the next step. It's like in the slight edge where it says you just have to start with a plan. I love that. So my plan is to one day do the pallets, but for right now, today, it just means going to the local thrift store and doing a little bit more research to get better. That's fantastic because yes, I think everyone eventually wants to do some kind of bulk purchasing. And what that would do is save time in theory. Right. Instead of buying items one at a time, you could buy items bulk. So um, we're going to be reviewing more and more deals. So I'm going to give you guys an example. I purchased Spanx for the first time from directly from the manufacturer. So um, yesterday I was borrowing somebody's eBay account to look on Terapeak um, for Spanx. But essentially, 56,000 Spanx are available for sale. This includes replenishables, which means that. There are a lot of items that are 80, like this one has 87 sold, right? Um, so this 56,000 includes um, the replenishable items. So my guess from looking at this is that there's about a million pieces of Spanx for sale. Even though it says 56,000, some of the listings have hundreds or thousands of quantity. So down here, I'm going to click on sold. You can see there's, there's 21,000, right? And you can now differentiate between pre-owned and um, new. Also, if you're going to go deep into one brand, I would check Vero. So this is how I would do it. You could just Google, um, is Spanx a Vero brand, as an example. And what will come up is some people have had their Spanx listings removed for two reasons. What do you guys think the reasons are? Reasons for what? That... Spanx went after them and removed their listing off of eBay. Stock photo is, is one. And Felicia said copying the description, that's number two. So now you know, when you sell anything on eBay, do not use the company's photos and do not use the company's description. That is the easiest thing for them to take you down on for Vero because all of those photos have data inside of them. So they can just do a quick search. Who's stealing my photos? Who's stealing my description? End it. I think the fastest one is KitchenAid. If you, if you list a KitchenAid item with the description or the photo, it's like five minutes you'll get a Vera. They just have something that crawls it. They don't want people using their photos. They spent 
probably $200 per photo. They don't want you using that. So it's important. Uh, no, I would not say from the website verbatim. That is not good because that will get you. Um, I got Becky. Um, that will get you in trouble because that's like saying this book report was by this guy. That's plagiarism. Can't use that as your own. That's somebody else's book report. Yep. So just be careful. You can. It's just like the situation where you're breaking the law, but you're not getting caught because you are stealing somebody else's intellectual property. Okay. So how I would deep dive something myself is now I'm in here. There's 21,000 items. Now you would take the time to research all of it. You would go through the different categories. You'd go through the different sizes. You would see like, wow, how did this sell for $29 pre-owned? Does this person at least have some photos of the actual item? Let's take a look. They do. <clears throat> so now, wow, okay. I know that this little red tag is Sphinx. Now when I go thrifting, I, I can spot this from a mile away. Who's been to the bins and noticed Spanx from a mile away? So easy oh, to yeah. spot. 100%. So easy to spot. So um, also, this is the first brand that I asked first, everybody that works for me if they've heard of Spanx. Oh, go ahead, Matt. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Was that a Here. stock photo or did that person like model it? No, stock photo. They just didn't get caught. Gotcha. That's yeah. what I was wondering. Yeah. Yeah, they just didn't get cut. I highly doubt this is a stock photo. And if it is, maybe they edited it slightly so it looks a little different. Maybe they took the stock photo and deleted the background. They did something so that it didn't pop up. But big companies will come after you. Um, I asked all of my workers um, yesterday if they have heard of Spanx. And all of them did, including the two guys that work for me. One of the guys that works for me wore it under his suit at his wedding. I didn't even know that. I didn't even know men wore Spanx. So now I know. So a household brand, quite different than the brands I typically sell, which are direct to consumer, not household brand, right? I just finished selling 30,000 pairs of Karayuma shoes, not a household brand. Eight out of 10 people, nine out of 10 people would have not heard of it, right? So very different approach, but the deep dive is important because if you're saying, hey, I'm researching whether or not I should try and sell Spanx. Now you guys have a connect. I have purchased from them directly now. So you guys can know one person that could get you an in on that. Now, the one thing that is unfortunate for me is that I've been doing this for a year and a half now, selling liquidation. I've never renewed with a brand, which, which is interesting to me. I, I don't know why I can't get a renewal the next year. But it just seems like every year it's open season and anybody can buy it. Um, there is a company that I've been working with called Shop Bazaar. You guys can check them out. They sell fast fashion. They have contracts with companies. And I don't know how they did it. So I should actually take the lady out the, to coffee and be like, how did you convince brands to give you the contract for their returns? How do you do that? They have... Um, the, the, I told you guys about this before, but there is a fas fashion brand called Cider. And they have millions of followers and they sell millions of pieces. This company, Shop Bazaar, has the contract for Cider. So everything that's returned or clearance goes to them. And they basically copied me and opened a whatnot that looks just like mine. Um, and it's fine. But I, it's interesting that that exists and that company is sellable shop bazaar can sell because it owns the contract for cider does that make sense guys all you guys need here is one contract and you, you could retire because you can actually sell that do they right. sleep on ebay because i feel like i've sold several items to shop bazaar you, you have it's there's, a, there's another company that's similar that's in japan with the yeah. same name I don't think it's called Shop Bazaar. It's something similar. Because um, I feel like I'm, every once thing. in a while, I'll get a, an order from something that sounds like Shop Bazaar and they yeah. send the same message to me once they buy. It's like, yeah. and it's please like, address it this way to the, you know. Yeah, please address it this way. Put the item number on the outside, blah, 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 blah. 
yeah that way because it's going to a shipping consolidator on the coast and going overseas paul is saying shop america but there, there's a um there's there's several companies that do that but if you can actually own the contract you can sell your resale company if melanie can figure out the local shop and she and they're in it could be as simple as whatever doesn't sell at the end of the season, I will buy from you for 20% of MSRP, right? And the company's like, oh my God, Melanie, you're such a lifesaver. You don't even have to have a discount rack anymore. At the end of the season, we call you, you come pick up all of it. We'll sign a contract, sure. Then they can have all full price items in their store. No discounted items. Everything is a home run. She can now take that and sell it to Keith because Keith wants to sell those products and you actually have something that's worth money. All of the big sellers are the same as small sellers. They just have like more suppliers and a slightly larger operation. The operation is the same. That's why people, I'm really confused when people say, um, oh, you don't do the same things that I do, but I, I am, it's just more often. I'm doing the same thing everybody else is doing, just more, more, more revolution. You didn't suck your thumb? That's good. We're on this um, no sucking thumb um, reward system. So if she doesn't suck her thumb for the whole month, then we get to go on the ferry. That's her reward. So that's the plan. She gets one star per day. Um, Melanie says she buys from Bazaar and has been impressed by the quality and cost of goods along with new brands. It's interesting because their cost of goods buying from them definitely under 10, sometimes under five. And um, reselling is really good. Yes, she's really happy about not sucking her thumb. We tried the nail polish that tastes bad, but it doesn't deter her. She's okay with the, the taste of it. So not doing that. Um, but yeah, parenting. Um, I noticed also a lot of the successful entrepreneurs I follow, they also have kids. So I can't use that excuse like, oh, I have kids. I can't build my business. That's not true because most people who are successful also have kids. So they just learn to have more skills to do it. That's what I, um, in that podcast I was listening to, they also mentioned that your capacity grows with kids. So like you just can do more stuff. If you have if you if you have things that constrain your time, you end up being more more capable. Um, so greatest reselling business, I would say enough space. Best is um space, enough capital. So what do you guys think? Like um, how many people listening right now have a capital restraint like you you do not have enough money to buy the number of items that you need to reach resar nirvana what do you guys think becky okay so i don't have enough money to reach reseller nirvana but what i do have is enough money to buy one good item to put in my store or two good items in my store yeah. so i'm just reshifting my focus to like that one or two items. And like, I put some things in my store yesterday that sold overnight because they were high sell through rate. That is so critical, yeah, especially yeah. for little sellers like me who are trying to get big, just focus on what is right in front of you. There's so many things that are, there's the low hanging fruit right there. And if, and I tell people in the, the second call all the time, I am such a dork, like in every aisle, I'm on my phone with my little, you know, group of items in my hand and I'm searching every single one. I didn't do that before. That is so critical. So if it is not really like 70% or over a hundred percent, I don't even pick it up. I leave it behind. Now my goal is to get bigger and do bigger things. But right now my job is to buy that one item that's going to be a seller and then it grows it compounds it compounds but it's still the same thing mm -hmm. people try to get fancy and instead of one good item i'm going to buy five average items 
Yes. And that's how I right. did my business for so many years. And it just does yeah. not work. It doesn't work. And also I would say, yes, I am looking to do palettes and new with tag things. But at the end of the day, if it doesn't work out, that's okay. Because thrift stores will always be there. And I can go to them and buy things. So if it doesn't work out, no, no sweat. I'll just keep doing what I'm doing. Yeah, that, that will work. Um, uh, somebody asked me, actually a few people asked me in the last couple of days, what would it take to make this group the best? Right? And I have a way, um, this is how I look at it. It doesn't matter how big the group is, for one. The best group does not necessarily mean the biggest group. There are reselling groups on Facebook that have 100,000 people in them. Um, I think, is it the resell? I forgot what it's called. It might just be called the resellers. The one that I originally joined when I joined um, reselling in 2016 has like 170,000 people in it. It's a ridiculous number of people in there. I, for me, though, the definition of the best group is not the most people in it. That's not. But if I was trying to make the best reselling group to me, um, I would actually interview everyone who applied. If I was going to try and go back and redo it, what I would do is, I'm not going to do this, but I would scrap the group, start over, and I would interview everyone coming in. And I would be like, hey, how committed are you to what's your income goal? And I'm going to make up one up for you. Whatever you need to pay your bills plus six grand. That's the income goal I'm going to set for you. Whatever you want to, whatever your bills are, plus 6,000 is the income goal. How committed are you to reaching this goal on a scale of one to 10? And if it's under seven, I would just n not let any of those people in. And then I would say, how committed are you to sharing with the group what you're working on? And if it was under seven, I wouldn't let them in the group. That's it. Just do, that's like a five questions. And then if I did that, the group would only have amazing people in it. it. It wouldn't be like you can join no matter what. That makes it harder. Learn. Hey, good morning. Um, I'm reading the book Good to Great right now. And yep. um, it talks about how important it is to get the right people on the bus more so than having <clears throat> before you decide your ideal or your goal or where you're going, how, how important it is to have the right people with the right character traits. Um, so anyway, I think that's so interesting what you're saying because it is about the people. It is about the resiliency and learning how to cultivate that. And like what Becky is saying about, you know, and what you're saying, I mean, all of this is like really jiving for me. It's like waking up, thinking about like what a gift this is to even be able to do this in the first place. And it's easy to say, oh, it would be so easy if I had this inventory coming to me and I was getting pallets and I just had all the all the top 30 brands that we looked at yesterday. Um, but I think that's like unrealistic to some degree because it's like putting it off. Like it's kind of diffusing personal responsibility, um, in my opinion, uh, to not actually do the thing and not actually do what is achievable for you day to day. So anyway. Thanks, Lauren. If you guys remember, I, at one point I mentored 10 people for a couple of weeks, maybe like a month and a half, I mentored 10 people and I, I cheated because I picked people that were going to make it anyway. Like I was like, do, do you have enough space? Yes, you have enough space. Are you going to work on this consistently at the same time each week? Yes. Okay. Are you dedicated to improving your own process? Yes. Okay. Even without me, they would have reached the goal. You can't, like, how do you not reach your goal? Either you, if you are working on your process, the only way you can not reach your goal is if you quit. If you get closer every day, you'll eventually hit your goal. The only way to not reach it is if you quit. You will reach the goal if you make improvement each day towards that goal. Like, um, who here has sold an item for more than $20 profit? Everybody, right? How come people are not like, okay, anything that's not this? No. If you spend $5 and sell something for 20 plus shipping, how is that not like, okay, I'm not going to do anything outside of this? 
It's so awesome. You went from being able to, you had one $5 bill, now you have three $5 bills. Yeah, we do need a where are they now episode. I can, I can track these people down. I, I do see them occasionally and they pop up. Um, it's, um, I know Mary, Mary was one of the original people. Um, and <clears throat> she's still, she's still reselling. Don't give people the password unless they share the screenshot of their 30 day total. That would be good. 30 day total would be a really good accountability tool. Um, and I, I, um, here's the part that I think is the most powerful. Um, I would say I probably have a, a couple dozen accountability partners and we send text messages to each other with different updates and all of it is stored in here. Right. So like I have the progress from like my screenshots that were like, when I hit $10,000 on my 90 day total, it was like, Oh my God, that's so much money. That was, that's $3,333 a month. When that happened, I was like, this is insane, right? Jamie? There's my application. There's my 30 Let's day. go. You're in. So now everybody screenshot that and we'll see if Jamie made progress in a month or he's out. Um, and the thing is, it's okay if you don't make improvement. We just want to know why not. Okay, you get your screenshot now quick. <laughs> Dude, those are solid triple digit improvements, sir. Well, what that's kind of skewed actually, uh, because I did that whole uh, test in March or yeah. February and there March with a where I dropped my promoter listing down to two percent and restarted. Um, so the, the four weeks before this were really horrible, so that's why I looked so much of a percentage gain. Well, well at least you know why. But yeah, that's um, to make this group the best, I would just kind of cheat the system and, and just moving forward. And I might, and maybe it does make sense for me to do this. I would just interview every new person that comes in. Because kind of my mantra for life is no scrubs. And that TLC song hits different for me. So I just want, like, we don't have time. We're only going to be here for a short time on earth. Let's try not to hang out with scrubs. Let's try to do the best we can, hang out the best people we can. Sometimes the best people that you can right now, they're all losers. That's okay. Then event, you just trade one out for a different person when you can. And I also realized that um, everyone that you know has a different purpose. Some people are not there for your financial gain. Like your dog is not there to help you with your business. It's a different kind of relationship and it suits a different purpose, right? So don't treat everybody like they're supposed to help you make more money. It's not related, not related. It's different because that can happen too. A lot of resellers become lone wolves out there. And the only thing they do is look for the best buck and they forget everybody else. <laughs> Thanks, Shane. I don't want to get a I don't want to get a Vero, so I, I took it out. But we're good. That three seconds is the song. <laughs> I only ran it for I only ran it for three seconds. I know. Thank you, sir. <laughs> um Lauren says her numbers are skewed right now, similarly with going full time. Um I also recommend that um if you can try testing a max week. That would be a fantastic experiment for everyone here. See the most that you could do in one week, and then you can always back off of that or the most you could do in one day, just, to, just so you have an idea of your baseline. And I actually think that a perfect resale business, you're operating less than 50% of what you can because you, you need time to think about the improvement. So for example, let's say um, Lauren was listing... Um, 12 items an hour and the most she could work on listing is four hours a day. So 48 is her max. If 48 was her max, I wouldn't want her to do 48 a day because then she'd have no other time to improve it or get it better. And Catherine's not here this morning, but I don't, I don't think it's good. The red line, you want to have extra everywhere 
Um, and the main way of doing that is not um, listing more. It's actually listing better. Yeah, it's interesting when I, so I quit my job April 1st and then it was like, I just immediately transitioned to, I was listing seven a day and then I went to nine a day right before. And then I was listing 15 a day because that seemed to me, I'd like to be selling 20 a day. So that, but that was like, okay, I'm stepping up, you know, up the ladder and, um, so I heard Matt talk about his plan of doing the 27, you know, three times a day or whatever to get his listing goal. And I was like, okay, that's perfect. I'll do 30, four times a day. I mean, four days a week and then one day of listing two days off. Um, but then I realized I hadn't photographed more than 25 sets at one time. So it's like, okay, 25 yep. is my max right now. So I have to like re recalibrate. So I'm like. 15 a day is my current and um, yeah. So, so all that to say the max day is really helpful. And then I'm realizing all the prep for me, the prep is kind of has been tripping me up a little bit because you have to plan ahead, think ahead, which is why you guys talk, you've always talked about, you know, like you do your listing, you know, you do your number for the day and then you prepare for the next day. And I remember on an old podcast, you talking about that and it's like you ha only have to do that the first time and then you you continue it you're good um yep. so anyway yeah i'm trying to figure out my max i guess just getting my listings up number one priority and then um but yeah you don't know what you can do if you haven't ever tested that max rep 100 percent. the the highest single listing goal i've ever done by myself is 30 so I've never had a listing goal of more than 30 and it was 42 a day, Monday through Friday. So I could take the weekends off. Um, and that, um, that 42 a day really like after two months of that, I decided I'm never, I'm never going to do this again. I don't want to do 42 a day. It's too much for me personally. So then I switched to, <clears throat> and this is something very, very, um, tangible for everybody here if you get to the point where you are not sourcing anymore i think that you could do 30 a day very reasonably that's 210 a week or 42 monday through friday considering no sourcing so all you do is go to work ship photograph oh, customer service photograph list put it away one person 42 monday through friday take the weekends off you have to ship saturday and sunday though because otherwise monday is horrible that model works however I didn't want to do that. So what I ended up doing is 105 a day. Um, one person listing and photographing 105 a day, Monday through Friday. And then me focusing on getting better items. And the 105 was enough to pay me more than I was making selling 42 or listing 42 a day plus the person's salary. So like it's more risk to bring on an employee. So you have to make more. Some people... Um, bring on an employee just to make enough to pay for the employee. That's not worth the risk. You have to make a lot more. So for everyone here listening that um, when I first started with one item at Savers 30 a day seems so ridiculous. Like how am I going to, how could you possibly do 30 a day? Right. That's such an, but that is, that's probably the milestone that is where people start making easily making six figures a year reselling. You consistently list 30 a day, you're going to make over 100,000 if they're all good items. It's, it's unavoidable. Math will not lead you wrong. 30 a day, though, and sourcing is a grind. That is a long day because it's just, there's just so, only so many hours in a day. And to find 210 good items and list 100, 210 and ship it, just a lot. That's the, that's the milestone, though, of what I would consider. Um, professional, professional level income. Like when people go get an MBA or they become an accountant or they become a doctor or a lawyer, they're hoping to make at least a hundred thousand. And they put in several years of work or schooling plus internship plus residency to do that. So for you guys to reach 30 a day, it's totally worth putting in a couple of years of sharpening up your skills. It's different though. 
because um, I know how to do it. So hiring help that helps with hiring, not knowing how to do it in hiring. I don't think works for, for our particular business. Um, here's the part that's interesting. Grind culture is it is toxic, right? Working 18 hours a day and not ignoring everything else. Business first, oh, business first, business only. Everything else gets what's left. The thing is, it, it might be necessary, though, at least at some point in the beginning when you're figuring it out. But what happens to a lot of people is they get on that bus and they just keep riding it. Right. So you want to just make sure that you understand the purpose of your temporary grind mode. Right. Because like your family is not going to forgive you. That's my point. Like if you want to be, um, you know, top parent and top reseller, that's going to take up your whole day. Becky. I was just going to say that I think a lot of us, this is, I'm talking for myself personally. I thought it was going to be very easy and cushy and fun and I could just make my own hours and do whatever. But the truth is, is if you really want to be successful, you have to work hard and it actually feels like a hard day's work. And what I was thinking about when you said that is if you would have gone to my grandfather, who was a World War II veteran, um, and said like he had a hard day's work every single day of his life sometimes he had two and three jobs but he was so wonderful and so present with his family like it can be done and i think our generation especially and the one coming up we don't know what hard work looks like and we need to work hard you know <laughs> if you want a success if you want to be successful it's got to it's got to feel hard you know um, do you think it's, we don't know hard work or we don't know focus? Oh, uh, well, definitely that. I mean, fact, focus, we don't know how to focus anymore. That's for I sure. feel like everyone in this group is working hard. Who, who are people here slubbing it? I don't think so. Not that I'm aware of. You're here at freaking six in the morning or, you, or here in the cal. If you're, if you're up in the morning on this call, you're probably not that lazy. That, that, this is the part that's this is the part that's crazy. Everyone here wants to pay their bills, right? Everybody here wants to make more than their bills. Everyone wants to have all these things. Everyone's goals are the same. So the goal is not enough. You can't just have great goals. That doesn't matter. Like it's just like the what does your day look like? That's why I kind of want, I'm gonna test this tomorrow. The first 10 minutes of the call is just gonna be silence. Write down what you're gonna do. Tomorrow is April 18th. In the first 10 minutes, I want everyone to write down what they're going to do tomorrow and then share it with the group. What does your Thursday look like? Here's the part that's crazy. If you add up everything you do on a Thursday and it's only like 80 bucks, you, that's not, that doesn't pay the bills plus $6,000 in savings. Right? You should be able to, I should be able to look at Lauren's calendar look at her day and guess how much money she made. That's why a nine to five is so effective. That's all I was saying is we don't treat it like a nine to five. We, we treat it like whenever I get to it, I get to it kind of thing, but it, it should be like a nine to five. Yeah. It should be a target. So like 27, three times a week. 42 five times a week this is um this is the um mentality when i went to um doll's kill to talk to the ceo randomly um he told me his goal for whatnot is 1000 listings seven i'm sorry 1000 auctions seven days a week he's like um i want to sell 1000 items a day seven days a week on whatnot and then that's it i'm not i'm gonna work on something else that's my whatnot business. So I want that to be the same for Matt. 27 items a day, three times a week. That's his eBay business. That's it. Not other, like, I hope he's not torturing himself with other things that are not that, because that's already a lot. That's already, let's just call it and then he can do other things. Matt, what do you think? Yeah, no, I've been thinking about this a lot lately, actually. Um, 
So when I think grind, first of all, because I'm like the non-grinder, but I work hard and I, I just want to I want to do it the easiest way possible with the least amount of work, which is sort of the opposite of the grind culture. The grind culture is if you can get it done in six hours, you do it in six hours and then you do six more hours of it. Right. Like it's like if you get it done, you're only getting it done faster to do more. I'm trying to get it done faster to be done. And, yeah. and not do it as much. Right. So like I, I could think of it as a nine to five. The problem is, is that sometimes it's like seven to ten. Right. And then it becomes a grind because it's not it's not like, oh, I'm just getting this done by five and I'm done. Now I put steps in and I'm trying to figure out how to do it so that it's like nine to twelve or nine to two. Right. That's what I want it to be. Um, and I realized I was like thinking about my business too much, like all day and all night, not disconnecting, which is not why I like why I went into this. Like it wasn't like, oh, I could just treat it, you know, like it's not important. But it's also like, no, this is all I'm doing now. Like I wake up in the morning, I start eBay. I do. I check my phone too much. I'm thinking about different ways to do it. I'm doing it all night. I'm thinking about it all night and then and on the weekends. And I was like, I, I just need this to be set it and forget it. I need it to be, I wake up, I do the listings for an hour. I do the shipping for an hour. I go and source for a little bit when I feel like it, which is a fun part. Then I'm yeah. done. And I don't think about another thing until the next nine, like two o'clock yeah. to midnight, my time. That's That's my ideal way of doing it. I think that's the best way to do it. That's like the, um, you know, I, uh, Jamie, you shared your screen, which is, which I love. And then I got 10 text messages from people sharing their screen. So let's do it. If you guys want, I think that is a very, very effective way of doing it. And I hope you guys in the group can get one accountability partner. It can be me, but I have to do email. Um, where you send your your ninety day total every thirty days, and we can check it out, Jamie. Hey Matt, are you still here? Yeah, I, I was serious about the what I put in the chat. Um, oh, <laughs> how, how, how do you handle like you say you do it like you schedule an hour a day for all this? So like when you're getting offers throughout the day, how do you handle those? Do you just wait until the next day to handle them? I thought you were asking me because because I talk about offers so much. Um, no, like I'm still not there yet, Jamie. Like this is where I want to be. Like I've still, you know, I, I cut down the amount of time that I check my eBay account. Um, so like I try not to do it after like five o'clock, but I do do it once before I go to bed. So um, I'll handle any offers like at that point. But my dream scenario of it is to just like do it in the morning and do it, do it once in the morning and then do it like once at the end of the day. Because the way I feel about an offer is like, at this point, like, I don't necessarily need to get back to you the second, like, if I'm just going to accept it, it doesn't matter when I accept, it, right? Like, you're just getting it for what you want. If I'm going to counter it, like, I don't stress the counters anymore. I've done that little system I told everyone about a, a few weeks ago. It, it just works for me. I have that message. And if the person never responds, I, I just, they go into the column of like, they were never a serious buyer and I wasn't going to get them anyway. I could get, I could sell anybody anything for half the price. If, you know, if someone just like sends me an offer and it's half the price, like I could sell anybody anything if I only charged half the price. If you're not willing to come up, I don't consider you as like a, um, a serious buyer and I don't sweat it if you, you know, if I counter offer your offer and you don't ever respond to me, it doesn't matter. Um, so my whole, my goal is like, check the offers once in the morning, you know, I'm on my phone doing eBay while I'm doing the job. So if offers come in while I'm on it, no problem. I just do it then. And then like once before I, you know, I'm willing to check out, I'm not at the point where I'm checking out at two o'clock yet, but I'm trying to get like closer and closer and closer to it. But, um, I can't remember which book it was, but it says like, you always want to be, what is it? It was like, it's like you always want to be the buyer in all the situations, even when you're the seller. Like you want, you don't want to be the one who's desperate for the yep. thing. You you want to be the one who has control over it. So over the transaction and you do it on your own rate. So like the idea of like rushing to like counter an offer or do an offer from a buyer, I'm like, no, like 
I have like I have control here. The ball is in my court. I will respond to this when I when I am able to respond to this. And like that's just the way I'm going to do the transaction. Uh, you want to figure out a way to have a 90 day snapshot for go ahead, go ahead, Bruce. No, I was just saying I disagree because I, I think if we're in the business to sell, we should uh, be accepting offers as fast as we can and trying to respond to the customer because they can get to the point where they send you an offer, but then they see another one, they send someone else an offer. And then now you lose that on, on that sale because somebody else is responding faster because yeah. they're you know, on the ground mode. So I don't want That's... it to get complacent. You know, it's, it's like an even balance. Like I definitely got slower with um, responding to offers and stuff like that, but I definitely don't want to get to the point where I'm waiting hours and hours to, to respond, you know? Yeah, it's definitely an interesting concept between always on and like most of the time on. I would say it makes sense to, it honestly makes sense to answer right away during normal business hours, like banker hours in general, because people are, wanting an answer right away um and if you if somebody get an if you get an offer at 7 p.m and answer in six at six in the morning it's not as unusual as you sending an offer at 9 a.m and getting no response till 6 p.m i'm sorry like i don't know it, it depends on if it's during the same day or after the day but as far as like the faster the better i totally agree with that that's why um for big companies, customer service is 24 hours a day. Jamie? Yeah, um, with the magazine category, I shut offers off. I, I got so many low ball offers, like not even enough to cover shipping. So at the first of this month, I shut offers off and it hasn't affected my sales at all. But I have, since I've done that, I've been more adamant about when I can send an offer, which means somebody put it on their watch list because I don't offer offers, you know, um, the faster I respond to those because they are people that put them on their watch list. I've seen a, a higher conversion rate. This is the faster because it kind of tells me like they're saving it, but they're also looking at other magazines to maybe come back to this one. So the faster I respond with a good offer on, on those, the higher conversion rate I have. Um, Jamie, that makes sense. Look, all of this is like so subjective. I don't begrudge. I don't think Bruce is wrong. I think Bruce is right. All I know is, is that I was going 24 seven for the last two years. And when I send offers out, my conversion rate on that is not a hundred percent, not even 50%, not even 40%, not even 30%. When someone sends me an offer and I'm going to accept it, um, I've never had it. I've had maybe one offer rescinded ever. 